Hello, I'm Mimi Stillman, flutist and artistic director of Dolce Suono Ensemble, and I'm here in Philadelphia with composer Richard Daniel Poor. My Dolce Suono trio with cellist Yumi Kendall and pianist Charles Abramovic have commissioned Richard to write us a trio, and we are so honored and thrilled to have this new work that we're going to be premiering on October 22nd in Philadelphia and subsequently touring with. Um, its title is Remembering Neda, Trio for Flute, Cello, and Piano, which has special significance for the composer. Richard, can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Well, Neda refers to a woman uh, by the name of Neda Sultan. She's also been referred to as Neda Sultani, who was a young woman uh, who was killed in uh, the middle of these protests and uprisings that happened in June of 2009, following the elections in Tehran. Now, the, the reason she is significant and has become a kind of uh, symbol of uh, a lot of the injustice that's going on in Iran at this time is because her death was actually filmed on camera and broadcast in front of millions of people I remember seeing it in June of 2009 on CNN. Um, she was also emblematic of the, the kind of quiet but determined protest that's going on in Iran today that's really essentially being led by the women of the country. Uh, there is a we don't hear too much about it in, in the States, but there is a kind of quiet, but, but nevertheless uh, steadfast, non-violent uh, counter-revolution that seems to be taking place that is led by the women, which as far as I know is, uh, is a first in, 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 in contemporary history. Uh, revolutions tend to usually be led by men. Well, it's so meaningful for us as artists to have a work that is not only significant in a purely musical way, but that is saying a very important and meaningful thing in terms of supporting people who, who deserve their freedom. And I know this is emerging from a personal heritage of yours as well. Yes, and, and you know, as, as you said, I, for years, I have my own personal family history having to do with Iran. My parents were born there. Uh, my father came to the States when he was a teenager. My mother came during, toward the latter part of World War II with uh, my grandparents and her siblings. Um, and, uh, and yet, um, with all of that, even though I was born in the States, uh, and they, in essence, grew up partly in, in the United States. The presence of, of a Persian culture was still very formidable in my life. And even more so, uh, it, it, it was even more so when uh, in 1963 my family went to Iran. I and my sister went for the first time. And we ended up living in Tehran for almost a year. Um, the memories from that time were, were, are still even to this day for me very vivid. But in a way, I had to go back to an oral memory, not just of the time that I was in Iran, but also of much of my childhood and the, the, the Persian music that seemed to have been filtering through the the rooms in our home when I was growing up. It was, it, it was pr very likely some of the first music I ever heard. Well, well, that's really interesting for us to know because we, as you know, uh, just had our about three hour rehearsal working on the piece with you. And in it, you're asking us to go places um, with our sounds and with our instruments that are um, not Western at times or with an influence from, from your mind's ear. Right, I was, I was mentioning to Charles earlier when we were taking our break that this is music of a Western composer with a Middle Eastern memory. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's very accurate. Uh, it, it, in some ways, 
um, the piece, the entire piece, just in terms of the very sounds, is about is about remembering. It's about my memory of that sound world and consequently that world. Um, I I think I mentioned to you that the first movement is a kind of paraphrasing of a Persian love song that I heard when I was very young. Uh, and I've only done this kind of thing one other time in a piece that I wrote in 2001 uh, for the New York Philharmonic and Yo-Yo Ma, and we used a Kemon Shep player by the name of Kehan Kalhor, who was like the, he was like the Yo-Yo Ma of the Kemon Shep. Um, and I actually quoted another, um, another uh, Persian melody in that. But in that piece, um, I wasn't, because the orchestra is so huge, you know, and, and, and because this was so new to me, I wasn't able to be as pervasive in my exploration of my ancient memory as I was in this case. But, but I had, that, that was the one precedent I had for it. And again, while the, the tune may not be entirely accurate, what makes it, I think, for composers interesting is how we remember the tune that we've heard. You know, I think when Stravinsky was using those Russian folk tunes for his three bestsellers, those early ballets in the beginning, he, you know, they're not exactly the folk tune verbatim. They're a little different, you know, in, in places. But, but it's his memory of the tune that makes Petrushka interesting, you see. Well, there's something so intimate about flute, cello, and piano that we can really work on these timbres and colors with you, some alto flute in addition to regular yes. flute and other effects. So, and, and that's what makes it, and that's also what makes it, um, I think possible to write a piece like this is that the, is that you have this combination and it lends itself to the possibility of those non-Western sounds. Well, thank you. We're so excited about it, and we look forward to the premiere. Thanks, thank Richard. You, Amy.